So I hope you can hear me. Hello and welcome to A Closer Look at South Korea. My name is Simona Grano and I am a senior lecturer and director of the Taiwan Studies Project at the University of Zurich. A Closer Look, as you know, is a series by the Asia Society Switzerland with support from BDO and the Institute of Asian and Oriental Studies at the University of Zurich. In this series, we shed light on Asian countries through the eyes of leading local voices. Today, we're looking at South Korea together with two distinguished guests, which I will introduce in a second. But let me remind you that in the last 15 uh, minutes or so of the coming hour, we also want to address your own questions on South Korea. So you can submit these questions already now through the Q&A function on Zoom. And if you see a question that you really like, you can upvote it so that it has bigger chances of being answered. <clears throat> Excuse me. I will now give you an introduction to South Korea before introducing our two guests. So let's begin with a couple of slides. I hope you can see them. So first of all, South Korea, officially named the Republic of Korea, lies on the southern half of the Korean Peninsula, and it is over 100,000 square kilometers in size, almost or roughly 2.5 times the size of Switzerland. And like Switzerland, the country is rather mountainous. Only 30% of it actually qualifies as lowlands. The highest peak Korea has, South Korea has, is uh, 1,950 meters. And it is an extinct volcano on Jeju Island, which you can see at the bottom of this map. <clears throat> Excuse me, I never had problems with my voices. When I have to moderate, of course, it happens. Let's go to some demographic facts now. The country has a population of around 51 million people, and roughly half of them actually live in the capital of uh, South Korea, Seoul, in the Northwest. South Korea's population is quite homogeneous with 96% being ethnically Koreans. Let's now go to the next slide about people and demographic. Korea's population has been shrinking. This is not just unique for South Korea, as we know in Asia, Japan is also and Taiwan affected by it. It has the lowest birth rate in the world, currently on average uh, 0.79 child per woman. And that number is actually declining with a, uh, quite a high life expectancy of almost 84 years. So with that in mind, we know that the population is rapidly aging. Koreans are very well educated with almost two thirds completing higher education. And the average household income is among the highest in Asia in the UN Human Development Index, which looks at factors like education level and income, South Korea actually ranks 19th worldwide and highest in Asia after Singapore and Hong Kong. <clears throat> Some economic facts now. So the Korean economy is the fourth largest in Asia after China, Japan and India, countries which all have much larger populations than South Korea. The majority of the economy's worth comes from Korea's famous chebols. These are huge conglomerates that spread out over multiple industries and are usually controlled by one individual or one family. Samsung, the largest of these, on its own accounts for about 15% of Korea's economy. Hugely important factors or sectors of Korea's economies are electronics, including semiconductors, shipbuilding, over 40% of world ships are actually built in South Korea, and the automotive industry in which Korea takes the fifth place worldwide. <clears throat> Excuse me, something about history now. So of course, as you can imagine, it's very difficult to summarize a country's history on a slide, but we're trying to do that and give you some facts and dates since 1910. So in that year, Japan annexed the Korean empire and controlled it until Japan's de facto uh, defeat in World War II. This period of Japanese colonization still actually causes a lot of frictions between South Korea and Japan. In 1950, North Korea invaded the South with support from China and the Soviet Union, and South Korea got American-led military support from the United Nations at the time. The fighting stopped three years afterwards in 1953, with the Korean Peninsula being divided by a demilitarized uh, zone along the 38th parallel. And currently, there still are 30,000 American troops stationed in South Korea. In 1961, after a period of unrest, General Park succeeded in grabbing power with a coup, and he ruled with an iron fist until his assassination in 1979. 
At the same time, though, South Korea's economy began uh, an unprecedented economic growth. And for three decades, the country's GDP was actually the fastest growing in the world. In 1987, after the death of a student caused massive protests in society, the authoritarian government actually agreed to, a direct, pres to direct presidential elections, wary of the protests that were actually continuing and dragging off into 1988, this being the year in which Korea was hosting its first ever Olympics. How well Korea's democracy has actually taken root was proven in 2016 when President Park Win Hee, -hye, daughter of the general of the 1960s, was fired from office after some of the largest demonstrations in the country's history against her corruption and abuse of power. Let's now talk about government branches. Like in most uh, modern democracies, the Korean government consists of three branches. The executive, currently led by President Yoon suk yeol the 300-member National Assembly, and an independent court system. Now, let's take a dive into South contemporary South Korea, and let's meet our two speakers from today, joining us from the capital of Seoul. So let me introduce them briefly. First of all, we have Professor Song Ju Lee. He's Professor of Political Science and International Relations at, Ch at Chung An University in Seoul, South Korea, and of course, also Chair of the Trade, Technology and Transformation Research Center at the East Asia Institute. He also serves as chair of the Advisory Committee on Economic Security and Foreign Affairs at the Korean Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He's also the co-author of the book, Political Economy of Change and Continuity in Korea, 20 Years After the Crisis, that came out in 2019. And he edited a recently published book, Korea's Middle Power Diplomacy, among other works. Usually his work is set at the nexus between economic security, US-China technology competition, and global digital governance. Welcome, Professor Lee. We'll have a lot to talk with you. And our second speaker for today is Shoni Sung. He's a public affairs and government relations consultant and Mac Consulting Group, also based in Seoul. And before that, Shoni worked as a consultant for US Department of State and as a program officer for Asia Society Korea, and the Republic of Korea National Assembly, where he actually works on programs with a focus on security and international affairs. Shoni holds a bachelor degree in political science and international relations from Yonsei University, as well as a master of international affairs from Columbia University. Welcome to both of you here today. Let's now start with the main part of our conversation. So, we have actually uh, promised our audience in the run-up to this webcast that we would look beyond the themes that we mostly hear about in Europe when it comes to South Korea, like K-pop and, of course, the never-ending threat from the North. But as you can imagine, we cannot skip talking about these entirely. So to begin with, Shoni, I'd like to ask you a question. Could you describe how South Koreans actually look at their own relationship with the North? And also with every new missile test that we hear about in the media, in the West, international headlines actually talk about increasing threats, but is that how people in South Korea perceive the issue? So are these, how are these threats perceived among your friends and colleagues, for example? Great. Um, first of all, thank you for having us. Um, it's a pleasure to be back um, at Asia Society in one way because I used to work here um, at the Korea Center. So it's, it's a real pleasure to be back um, as a part of this community again. To, to answer your question, I think there is an outsized interest in how um, North Korea and South Korea are interacting, at least on the international relations stage um, in the eyes of the global public. But for South Koreans, this has somewhat become a day-to-day -day, um, thing. And North Korean provocations and nuclear and missile threats have become nothing completely out of the um, ordinary sort of purview of our everyday livelihood. And I don't think it is really that much of a of, of a big threat for um, the the every you know Joe and Mary out there. I think we can compare a little bit with the threat coming from China towards Taiwan, where of course the situation is more tense now, but people have gotten used to it for obvious reasons, right? What about you, uh, Songju? Would you like to add something to that, or do you agree? Yeah, basically, I agree with him. Uh, but one thing I would I would like to point out is that uh, actually. Uh, general public in South Korea has become sometimes a, a bit indifferent to the North Korea's nuclear programs because many 
of South Korean general public actually tends to think that the uh, uh, recent nuclear uh, program has to do with uh, uh, restoring or resuming the dialogue with the United States. In that regard, I think the South Korean general public tends to be a bit indifferent to the recent uh, uh, provocation of the North Korea's nuclear programs. Okay, so since you mentioned now this the, the nuclear weapons and this topic, let's let's stick with that for a second before we move on to other topics. So, um, for our audience, uh, President uh, Yoon Suk Yeol last month actually proposed a solution to deal with the increasing nuclear threat, we, we, which we just heard from you, from Pyongyang. And this solution, according to him, would be that South Korea should also actually develop its own nuclear weapons. And a recent poll showed that seven out of ten Koreans could actually be or are in favor of this, as well as an overwhelming 79% of the people actually think that the nuclearization of North Korea is actually impossible. So, so Sung Ju, for you, this question first, how serious is the president's, uh, President Yoon's plan to develop nuclear weapons? And how would you characterize his North Korea policy? How much of it is it actually aimed at your own domestic electorate and how much and outside, for example, at the United States? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is a very good question. Actually, as is well known, uh, South Korea has been trying to deter North Korea's nuclear program for the last more than 20 years, but with little success, actually. So in a sense, it is true that the dissatisfaction and concern of the general public in Korea about this nuclear program issue has substantially grown for the last couple of decades. And I think there has been an increase in general public's sympathy for the necessity of possessing the nuclear weapons as an uh, alternative to deal with the uh, tough situation on the Korean Peninsula. I think in that regard, I think Korean public is very much worried about the sophistication or advancement of the North Korea's nuclear program. And I think it is against this backdrop that the Yoon suk yeol government mentioned the possessing nuclear weapons uh, Mm, uh, from the perspective of domestic politics. At the same time, I think uh, Yoon suk yeol government's uh, policy stance of possessing nuclear weapon has two policy goals. One is that the uh, uh, Yoon suk yeol government made it clear that the North Korea's nuclear program will not be tolerated any longer. And the Yoon government actually is a relatively conservative government, particularly compared to the previous government, and tries to differentiate away from the previous Moon Jae-in government's North Korea policy. In that regard, I, I would say Yoon suk yeol government announced the so-called audacious in initiative as a policy stance toward dealing with uh, North Korea in August 2022, 20, last year. And the main content of it is that uh, to provide uh, support uh, for the development of the North Korean economy if North Korea ceases to develop the nuclear programs. The second aim of the Yoon suk yeol government's mention of the possessing nuclear weapon is that uh, actually South Korea's possession of nuclear weapon may be a critical issue that affects the strategic balance, not just on the Korean Peninsula, but as well as the uh, East Asia and the global context. In that regard, I would say the cooperation with the United States is pivotal and absolutely necessary in its effort to possessing the nuclear weapons. So Yoon suk yeol government pursues the U.S. Uh, extended deterrence or redeployment of the U.S. tactical weapons on South Korea. So in that regard, I think uh, uh, Yoon suk yeol government took advantage of the possessing nuclear weapons as a bargaining chips in dealing with the United States. Thank you, Sonju. That was a very comprehensive answer. But Shoni, if you have anything to add to this as well, before I move to the next topic, just let me know. Yes, um, maybe just a brief couple of lines. I think it's also important to note that the politician that is Yoon suk yeol when he was a presidential candidate back in the days, was actually gaining popularity because of his sort of um, stark contrast made vis-a-vis -vis the Moon Jae-in administration. So whatever the kinds of engagement policy that the Moon Jae-in administration was engaging in, the Yoon suk yeol administration would naturally want to go against that maneuver and movement. So I think it's important to draw the stark contrast that the Yoon suk yeol administration would be interested in drawing um, with, uh, with his own administration as opposed to his predecessor. Thank you. Thank you very much for making also this point. I think it's, uh, it's always a very uh, an issue of polarization in many societies, right? That the 
next government will try to do exactly the opposite, notwithstanding the fact that sometimes it's not necessarily in the interest. I'm not making the case for South Korea of, of the country, but let me now go on with a slightly different topic. So we know that South Koreans, or at least in the West, we have this maybe um, slightly stereotype uh, idea that South Koreans have a reputation for working really long hours, especially if you count the leisure time spent with your manager on workday evenings or sometimes on the weekend. So in 2021, the average Korean worked uh, 1,915 hours according to the OECD and 200 hours, that means 200 hours above the average of all OECD countries. So to compare, the average Swiss employee worked 1,533 hours in 2021. Shoni, I would like to ask the question to you first. What does your work week look like? And do these statistics apply to you as well? In other words, is there still this uh, expectation for Koreans to join their boss at the bar after work or on the weekends? Or is any of that actually changing? So I'm going to probably have to answer your question in two parts um, and make it a running jump rather than a standing jump, if you know what I mean. Um, the first part would be lar large part of that kind of work culture has disappeared with the, with the advent of COVID because COVID has, to a large extent, eliminated the kind of um, close contact work environment that we were so used to having. But um, once you know this pandemic has struck us, I think South Korea notwithstanding, a lot of us were forced to work from home remotely and social distancing came in place and also curfews were institutionalized all across the board. So all those things put in place resulted in a corporate culture that was increasingly more lenient about people joining their bosses after work for, for meals or for drinks, so on and so forth. So a huge part of an, 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 an accidental fortuitous coming uh, of, a, of a labor environment that got more lax and lean was because of COVID. The other part is there was um, a movement at the state legislature level that legislated um, the, 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 the legal work week reduced, I think, from 60 something hours to 52 hours per week. So right now, with the exception of some very small and medium sized business enterprises in the country, large corporations cannot force their employees to work more than 52 hours a week, which is a huge step forward from what it used to be like back in the days when people used to work themselves to, to sometimes to death even. So I would say the situation has grown, gotten a lot better over the years to a large extent, um, attributable in some part to COVID and in other parts to policy improvements made at the National Assembly level as well. Thank you for that. Would you like to add something, Sonju? Yes, that actually, yeah, the situation has uh, gotten better, but I would say the speed of change is very uh, rather modest or slow. Uh, but one thing I would, I would like to add is that the, Actually, there is a general generation gap in terms of the high, uh, long working hours, particularly young generation tends to place a high priority on so-called work-life balance. So in that regard, I think the uh, business or working culture would be like a changing for the uh, like a last couple of years. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that I, I understand what you mean, yeah. It makes sense that there is a generational gap on this. So let's remain actually on this topic of demographics. And this question would be for you, Songju. Um, we know that the most pressing issue regarding the Korean labor market seems to be the fact that it is really shrinking, right? As is the entire population, obviously. And South Korea has a very low fertility rate like other countries in East Asia. Um, for three years in a row now, it has the lowest in the world with currently, as we said before during the presentation, a 0, 0,79 children being born, 0, 0,79, sorry, children being born per woman. So the government, this has varied ramifications, of course. One of them is the government warning that the public pension reserve will run out of money by 2055. And the UN projecting, of course, that South Korea's 51 million population of today will probably become half of its size by the end of the century. So. Mm -hmm. What are, in your opinion, the effects of these demographic trends? Are they already noticeable nowadays in the day-to-day -day life of Koreans? And also, what causes this low fertility rate? And what is the government doing to reverse this? Yeah, actually, as you just mentioned, uh, Korea has one of the lowest fertility rate uh, in the world, actually. Uh, as of last year, it was 0 0.79 and the lowest among the OECD countries. And also... Uh, low fertility rate 
uh, not only produce its negative impact on the future economic growth of the Korean economy, as well as causes uh, economic, social, and political problems at uh, nowadays. Uh, the first thing I would like to emphasize is that the imbalance between the big cities and countryside has grown uh, for the last uh, decade or two. Uh, actually, the population decline caused by the low fertility rate took place first in the countryside first. And then due to the lack of the decent and or high quality jobs in countryside, many people, particularly young generation, uh, tend to move to the big cities, uh, which leads to a vicious circle that further promotes or facilitates the hollowing out the countryside. That is the first uh, phenomena I can notice uh, recently. The second uh, issue is that the Korean government has attempted to make a policy change to tackle these social, economic, as well as political problems. But uh, in order to, to deal with the low fertility rate, the Korean government has tended to rely on the providing economic incentives, such as subsidies to the uh, uh, childbirth subsidies or child support programs. But however, uh, criticism has been mounted uh, for this kind of approach because like uh, it, it, this kind of approach did not uh, deal with the problems effectively. So Korean government tried to make a kind of a paradigmatic change in terms of the dealing with the low fertility rates. So there is a growing recognition within Korea that it is difficult to increase the birth rate without creating a social atmosphere that can maintain work-life balance in Korea. So of course, it is difficult to see or anticipate how these changes will fold out uh, in the coming years, but it is a kind of paradigmatic change in terms of the uh, social as well as government policy dealing with uh, these kind of problems. Thank you, Sonju. Do you have anything to add to this, Shoni? Maybe just a small uh, couple of comments um, like last time. So if you take a look at the current trajectory of how the fertility rate is sort of formed around the current structure of demographics in South Korea, I think the fertility rate in Korea right now is around 0 0.7 um, plus or minus, right? So it falls somewhere within that purview. And I think you need about a fertility rate of 1.2 to sort of maintain your national population, which means right now South Korea is, is sort of going backwards at, at an incredible rate. Now, this trend is probably forecast to, to last until the 50s and the 60s. Um, a lot of the experts who study the trend um, sort of analyze and see, foresee that this trend will continue until 2061 at, at the worst, the wor in, the, in the worst case scenario. So if you sort of extrapolate the current trends all the way to the next 30, 40 years, the, the implications will be far reaching, not only in terms of our labor market, and the economy, but I'll also take into account the fact that South Korea is still in a state of stalemate with North Korea. So we need a lot of foot soldiers and, and armed personnel across the 38th parallel and the borderline um, a bit vis-a-vis uh, -vis the North Koreans. So that um, sort of active duty personnel that we need in the bare minimum to be able to guard, safeguard our national borders um, against so, sort of the regime in Pyongyang will be very short staffed in the next several years, if not if not the next uh, few years. So this, this is another kind of repercussion that we see coming, not just in terms of the economic and financial impact it's gonna have on South Korea. Thank you for that. Also for bringing in the military expert, of course, let, let's remain with the sort of like with another societal issue that is of concern in, in South Korean society. And let's talk a little bit about uh, gender equality, maybe starting with you, Shoni. So um, this is an increasing topic for discussion in South Korea with a lot of uh, women getting frustrated for the traditional expectations of Korean society and also with uh, the fact that uh, there is a, a little bit of chauvinism sometimes uh, in Korean society, according to these women. So I have read, for example, that women in South Korea are turning to the so-called for no no dating, no sex, no marriage, and no child rearing, which is also even more of a problem for the topic we have just discussed a second ago. And in a recent poll, two out of three Korean women actually said that they don't want to have children and they prefer to choose a career over getting married. But what's also taking place in South Korean society is that over time, there seems to be a counter movement to this by some young Korean uh, men 
claiming to be the victim of uh, this increasing women activism. And what's noticeable for us also, it's that President Yun won last year's elections partly by riding on such sentiments, promising, for example, to abolish the Ministry of Gender Equality and also to remove any reference to gender equality from school textbooks. So the question for you, Shoni, would be what is happening now on this front one year after he has been elected, but also how are young people uh, such as yourself perceiving these two opposing trends? Um, thank you for your question. I think is I think this is, as you said, sort of an increasing discourse that's taking up a larger and larger space within South Korean public um, livelihood. Um, it's true, I think, and there's probably no, no difference of opinion when it comes to this point that women have been subject to a lot of male chauvinism, sexual violence and discrimination in South Korean culture over the last many, many decades. Um, the, the frustration that they have with regard to the kind of gender inequality um, in, in this country is, I think, very much um, um, well justified. The gender Nowadays, Koreans tend to look at this issue not just sort of through the lens of women's frustration, but a lot of the times the news media would, would frame it in the, in the wordings such as gender conflict. So it's not just an issue of women having frustration with, with the current state of affairs, but also men having frustrations about the, their own rights and, and, and I think um, place in, and standing in South Korean society being disenfranchised. And I think to a large extent, that comes from the fact that the male voters um, or, the, or the male part demographic view themselves as disenfranchised increasingly because they're the only ones that have to serve in the military, um, while women get to spend the prime of their life while they're sort of stepped away in the military doing two years um, of service. So women, I think, to a large extent, have historically been disenfranchised, and men nowadays um, have a reactionary sort of draw from from the kinds of empowerment that women are getting um, as of recent years. And you're absolutely right that the Yoon Suk-yeol administration has successfully ridden on this sentiment to get elected into office. He did promise to abolish the ministry of, um, the, the accurate term would be the ministry of gender equality and family. He did um, promise as a part of his political pledge to eliminate this ministry. There was a lot of controversy around whether or not he would actually go ahead and, and successfully eliminate the ministry because that takes a lot of administrative power and political will. There was a lot of political uh, back and forth within, within the administrative branch. And I think it was last year, um, around October, they actually decided to abolish the ministry, but not completely get rid of all the functions that are installed within the ministry. What they decided was in effect to formally get rid of the ministry of gender equality and family, but then, um, carve out the functions of the ministry and replace it under, say, the Ministry of Health and Welfare and the Ministry of um, Employment and Labor, where, where those things um, sort of sort of respectively fall under the purview of. And I think if you were to ask me what might be sort of the way forward or out of this, um, because gender inequality and the issue of gender conflict in South Korea is such a huge issue that takes up enormous space, I think one way to go about this is conversation and discourse and try to engage um, the, 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 the camps and the sides that think completely differently on this issue. But the other side, I think, the other side of the po policy solution to this issue is part of, I think, what Yoon Song-yeo administration is doing um, okay on, which is while he promised to completely get rid of the ministry, what he ended up doing um, was not completely get rid of the functions of the ministry, but he, you know, re sort of allocated the functions of the ministry to other relevant ministries across the administrative branch. Like I said, the Ministry of Employment and Labor, where they could actually take care of how women's labor relations and rights could be, could be um, empowered. So I think that's one way to go about fighting this battle if we were to sort of empower women's rights in South Korea and further their, their advancement. Thank you, Shoni for a very comprehensive uh, answer. Um, Sunju, the next question is for you, uh, a slightly different topic now. Let's talk about politics again. So next year, <laughs> South Koreans will actually choose a new national assembly. And currently the opposition Democratic Party actually has the majority uh, with 171 seats versus the 110 seats of the President Yoon's People uh, Power Party. 
So to get anything uh, done or to achieve things before the end of his uh, single five-year term in 2027, Yoon will actually need to win a majority in the National Assembly. And while the international media continues to focus on North Korea and, of course, those that are the major geopolitical challenges for uh, South Korea facing President Yoon, I think that probably we can say quite safely that domestic affairs will also play a very big role in the minds of South Koreans when they go to the polls in April 2024. So can you tell us maybe, Sonju, what do you think are some of the domestic issues and how will President Yoon try to tackle them in order to win votes? Yeah, actually, like, uh, just to Shoni mentioned, the gender inequality issue yeah. is going to be a, another hot topic in the next National Assembly election. From the domestic political point of view, actually, gender inequality is a kind, you know, kind of a relatively new issue uh, yeah. for the last several decades, overshadowed by the regional cleavages as well as economic inequality related issues. So a gender inequality issue will be will hang around uh, in Korea for quite some uh, time in the next uh, several years. Uh, at the same time, uh, as shown in the course of the last presidential election, the core issue uh, in Korea was that the fairness, actually the actually cr criticism mounted that the social leaders and uh, also elites violated or sometimes circumvented laws, rules and social agreements or consensus to pursue their uh, own interest. So unfairness exacerbated uh, economic inequality as a social division and political polar polarization. That is a kind of general public's understanding and uh, discontent. So this kind of problem will uh, uh, lead into the Korean politics uh, in the next general election as well. But at the same time, the pro president uh, Yoon Song Yeol was elected with the a campaign pledge of fairness and freedom, as is, uh, uh, and he emerged as a symbol of the uh, uh, leader of the uh, representing the fairness and freedom. So, at the domestic policy level, I would say the focus on winning support from middle class or median voters uh, would be the uh, uh, focus, uh, high pri priority of the both parties uh, election campaign. They try to present uh, alternatives to paradigm, uh, pragmatic issues such as economic downturn, uh, population aging, and the pension reform. Those practical issues would be the another uh, core issues in the next uh, National Assembly election. Korea, as a relatively new democracy actually has experienced a lot of unsubstantial difficulties in reaching a political compromise and consensus between the parties under the situation of divided government. We don't have many experiences how to deal with the problem associated with the divided government. So in that regard, institutional reform to address this issue will be another uh, core issue in the next uh, National Assembly election. Uh, Meanwhile, in terms of foreign policy, North Korea related issue will be on the top priority and also how to respond to the strategic competition between the United States and China will be another major issues. So in that regard, I think the, uh, uh, there will be a kind of shift of the policy focus for away from the fairness related issues to the more practical uh, issues. Thank you, Sonju. So let's move a little bit to another topic. As you know, Asian Society, a closer look series also wants to give a slightly different picture of countries and not just talk about politics. We can come back to that later anyhow. But Shoni, the next question from, from me would be about coffee consumption and what is happening in South Korea. Because as we talked about before during our prep call, at the end of 2022, actually, there were 99,000 coffee shops in the country, twice as many as four years earlier. And we know that the import of coffee also has doubled in that time. And that, for example, just a couple of weeks ago, Starbucks announced that every hour, 100 Koreans sign up for its membership rewards program since it was introduced in 2011. So what is going on on that front? How do you explain this trend to us? So you're absolutely right. It's one of that coffee consumption has exploded in South Korea in recent years. But this trend is not completely new. And what I mean to say by that is coffee consumption was not down here and then it suddenly reached, you know, explosive levels in the last four or five years. Coffee consumption had always been quite high in South Korea. And it's because the history of culture surprisingly goes quite 
uh, way back. Mm. Before, I think, the advent of the coffee shop culture uh, took place in South Korea. And in South Korea, we call them cafes. Um, b- before coffee shops became sort of enormously popularized within the country, there was a broad sort of basis of Korean consumers that used to take up a lot of instant coffee. Um, within the country. And surprisingly, what uh, South Koreans call mixed coffee, instant coffee, was invented in South Korea to a large extent. So that commercial invention that took place in South Korea very, very early on um, at the industrial phase, and then sort of took up a large part of the population as avid consumers of the product met with a kind of um, new type of coffee culture that came into South Korea, along with the, the enormous brands and franchises like Starbucks. And those two confluences met, and I think it sort of begot the enormous explosive demand that we're seeing today. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. So, so now I said we would take a slight detour and then go back a little bit to politics, especially because Songji, you want to talk about one of your books. So you edited this very interesting book, Korea's Middle Power Diplomacy, right, last year. And I, of course, we would like to ask you, first of all, because we know that South Korea sometimes has or faces a little bit of a problematic relationship with Japan due to its colonial past. But at the same time, of course, South Korea and Japan have now a common geopolitical threat or security threat in East Asia, which is a far more belligerent China. And of course, its posture towards Taiwan, right? And of course, the role that South Korea and Japan could play in a potential war scenario if the United States were to intervene, and, and in my opinion, they would, if Taiwan were to be attacked. So, but of course, we also know that China is uh, South Korea's by far largest trading partner, comprising 25% of South Korea's trade. And of course, South Korea has on and off throughout these uh, past few years been the uh, victim of China's, how can I say, trade sanction or uh, economic ransom sanctions, right? When uh, China reiterated to something that South Korea did, for example, in 2017, right? As Seoul decided to allow the US military to base this uh, THAAD missiles system on its territory. So to come to my questions for you is, do you think in the future, in light of the common problematic in East Asia, Japan and Korea will be able to find a common ground to face China's assertiveness? And how much of that would also, you know, have an impact on the own relationship that these two have with the United States? How will that affect the fact that you have a very strong military presence of U.S. troops in South Korea as well? Yeah, thank you for mentioning my book. Uh, Actually, the reason why I decided to publish the book on middle power diplomacy has to do with the uh, changes in world order. Actually, as evidenced by the fact that uh, uh, COVID-19 rapidly proliferated into various countries in the world. Actually, we are facing the so-called global challenges. In order to meet the global challenges, we have to organize very effectively global responses. But however, as we have seen in the US-China strategy competition, actually the both countries tend to make the unilateral move rather than organize the international cooperation. That's why we are currently observing the leadership vacuum in, a, in the context of the dealing with the global challenges. That's one of the reasons why uh, I uh, work on the middle power diplomacy because the middle powers are actually promising candidates to fill the vacuum left it by the uh, United States and China. So in that regard, South Korea as one of the middle power countries try to uh, enhance cooperation with other like-minded countries. That is one thing we have to keep in mind in the coming years, as we will see for more and more global challenges, the how to deal with those challenges. I think the cooperation between like-minded countries would be one option we can shoot for. And also, Many middle power countries, like including South Korea, Japan, and some European countries, actually faced the strategic dilemma of choosing between the United States and China. So in order to deal with such a strategic dilemma, you cannot do it alone. Actually, you, you have to find the partners to make a collective response to the 
uh, heightened uh, challenges arising from the U.S.-China strategic tradition, uh, strategic uh, competition. In that regard, middle power diplomacy is another uh, uh, possibility to deal with such a strategic dilemma. As for your question about the Korea-Japan relationship, actually, as is well known, from the perspective of Korea, uh, the Japan issue is, has been always domestic, domestic issue. So it's going to be a bit difficult for South Korea to restore the relationship with uh, Japan at the bilateral level. Of course, the current Yoon suk yeol government will make a lot of efforts to resume the talks and conversations and cooperation with Japan, but there will be limit, at least uh, from the perspective of domestic conferences, uh, uh, dom domestic politics. In that regard, uh, it is better for Korea and Japan to pursue cooperation in the context of a trilateral or regional cooperation framework. So it's going to be the one area of uh, policy priority between the two countries. So in the case of the trilateral uh, cooperation, actually, South Korea places a higher priority on co uh, cooperation with the United States and Japan simultaneously. So that kind of cooperation scheme will be restored pretty quickly. And also in terms of regional cooperation, actually South Korea uh, is very much interested in promoting the so-called Indo-Pacific strategy, which is core areas of concern by the United States and Japan. So in that regard, there will be ample room for South Korea to seek cooperation with Japan. Thank you, Sunju. I think you make a very valid point that uh, South Korea is not alone in this, of course, strategic competition being in the middle, caught in the middle of it. I think we feel this more and more, even in Europe, and we are geographically very distant from the area. And nevertheless, we are increasingly caught up in this competition more and more here as well, especially after the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, we are actually almost reaching the time of the webcast in which we open the floor to the discussions from the public. But let me ask you one last question before we come to that. Shoni, I'd like you to, to give it a try first, if you want. Um, it's a more pop culture oriented question. Uh, in 2021, the Oxford English Dictionary for the first time included this word Hallyu, a Korean term for the wave of South Korean cultural experts that first overtook neighboring countries in Asia in the 1990s and early 2000s, and then of course became a global phenomenon from Sai Gangnam style, topping global charts in 2012, to director Bong Yeon's Ho, 2019 movie Parasite, uh, winning the first ever Best Picture Oscar for a non-English language film, to Netflix Squid Games in 2021, becoming of course, as we know, the streaming service uh, most watched series at launch ever. And of course, K-pop music, I don't even have to mention that. But the question would be, can you briefly describe to us what, in your opinion, has made Korean pop culture so massively successful as an export product? Because ultimately, it is appealing to all of us, even though often most of your audience does not even understand the language. What do you think that is? What are the motivations for this? Well, to sort of answer your question backwards, I think it's also important to note that the, the large part of the global population that consumes, for example, Hollywood and American culture don't necessarily speak English as their first language, but American culture had been able to become really successful. So I don't think language necessarily has to be sort of a prerequisite to global success. Now, that being said, if you ask me why South Korean K-pop, you know, Korean pop culture had been, has been so successful over the years, that would be very difficult to answer. And it's always easier to sort of come up with, with a, with a, uh, one fits all solution or or interpretation of why things worked out that way, um, sort of retroactively looking back, right? But um, if you were to ask me, I think to a large extent, it's because South Korea likes um, and is very good at mixing things up and coming up with a fusion of um, a lot of different things that is usually bigger than the sum of its parts. And what what I mean by that is, if you really take a look at the sort of historiography of K-pop, meaning how the history of K-pop has developed over the years. K-pop is really a history of fusion and synthesis because it, it, a lot of people like to assume that K-pop has its genesis in Gangnam style, like you mentioned, or in the movie Parasite, uh, directed by, by, by the famous world-class director, Pujano, or through Netflix's um, global hit uh, special series, The Squid Game. But, but if you really take a look at the history of K-pop and sort of K, all things um, successful, it, it really began sort of in the 60s when South Koreans began to mimic 
sort of U.S. pop culture um, in, in sort of the U.S. Uh, uh, forces Korea, U.S. bases located in South Korea. So it all started with South Koreans sort of mimicking or trying to emulate what's best out there in, in Western culture. And then that combined with um, the idol um, training system in Japan, previously known as J-pop, combined with the, the sort of diligent working ethics of the, of the South Korean industry, I think put forward the kind of hugely successful idol culture and K-pop culture that we're seeing today. And that has sort of disseminated and, and spread across all industries in, in the culture entertainment sectors. Brilliant. And we are also perfectly on time to start with the questions from the public. So for both of you, whoever wants to go first, I'd like to ask um, one question about Korean labor laws. Uh, the, the question is, Korean labor laws and strong power of the unions, of the trade unions, are actually among the reasons why a lot of multinational companies are quite hesitant to invest in South Korean businesses. Do you, do you think there are any reforms on the horizons regarding this uh, stringent rules and regulations? And, or can you comment on this in general? Would uh, any of you like to go first? Johnny, you wanna go first? Um, Professor Lee, I, I mean, I'd, I'd be happy to give it, to give the floor to you. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, uh, I'm not an expert on labor law, but one thing I, I can tell you is that uh, actually the current UN government, which is quite uh, rather con uh, conservative conserv uh, compared to the previous government, tries to make uh, some changes in labor law, such as the like uh, 52 hour working hour limit actually will be relaxed uh, in the uh, in the coming months. Of course, the, uh, it's gonna require the agreement from the opposition party. So uh, current union government will, will make uh, some of the meaningful changes in terms of labor law, but as is well known in Korea, the labor union is highly well organized and the, it is a source of political power, very well attached to the some opposition parties. So it's going to be a daunting challenges for the Korean government to make a substantive or a fundamental uh, change of the labor law. Okay, right. So so let's maybe ask a question that is more up your alley, but uh, thank you for this very, comp uh, very, very well answer. And that actually maybe for you, Professor Lee uh, Songju, this is about um, the person would like to know, how do you think that the concept of the Indo-Pacific, the Western concept of the Indo-Pacific and the global security initiative by China will actually impact South Korea's role as a middle power state? Hmm. Yeah, so actually uh, December of last year, the current government announced the so-called Indo-Pacific strategy of South Korea. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the reason why the South Korea is interested in the Indo-Pacific is that it is a source of economic vitality. Actually, a lot of countries, including even including European countries, actually tend to perceive Indo-Pacific region as a source of economic vitality. And the South Korea is the same, trying to tap into the vitality of the uh, Indo-Pacific region because uh, in Korea at the domestic level, so economic momentum or economic vitality has substantially declined for the last several years. So in that regard, the uh, Korean government tries to make an economic approach to the region at the same time. Indo-Pacific uh, region has a lot of strategic importance uh, in the sense that the, the US, uh, United States and China clash uh, at the regional level in the uh, in, in the Pacific uh, area. So in that regard, like many of countries in the Pacific region do not want the uh, region fall into the site for the US-China strategic competition. In that regard, they do have some because shared understanding how to facilitate the cooperation and preventing the spread of the uh, strategic competition in the other parts of the region. Okay, Shoni, would you like to add anything to that or, or shall I move to the next question? Um, if you were to ask me sort of what would be the key um, structural issue with South Korea's labor market or labor sort of union issue, I would say that that one of it, um, one, one, of the, one of the things that sort of plagues South Korean labor issues is the fact that the, the key special interest groups um, formed around the issue of labor relations and labor unions are usually um, structured around corporations and their permanent workers. 
Now, one of the key sort of problems in South Korean industries and economy is the gap that exists between permanent workers and impermanent workers, the temporary workers who don't have a permanent job. But there is a lot of criticism with regard to the labor unions that are that have the that are the most vocal in, in the public spaces because people say that they're not really an accurate representation of the average um, laborers and average workers in the, in the South Korean economy. Right, and that would have been actually the next question that I wanted to ask, which is partly related to, to, to this and to what you just have replied to us, but maybe just to go a little bit more in depth, there is one person who would like to know, given the fact that the country continues to age, first of all, how can Korea continue to remain economically competitive? Is there still a place for these chai balls in the current form? And maybe tying into that, a question I would have liked to ask you if we had time, I will tie it to this one in. Um, there is, of course, a need because of what we also mentioned before, the demographic change in South Korea to possibly import more foreign workers, right, in South Korea. But this is also, of course, a problem of uh, well, societal attitude maybe towards, there's to a certain extent also a lot of hostility against immigrants. Could you comment on these two things? How can Korea remain competitive, economically competitive, given the current uh, system? And also, what about foreign workers? So I think you are absolutely right in asking that it, it would be important for S South Korean cyber corporations to really ask themselves and think about um, whether or not their current structures are sustainable in the long run. Um, it probably is not, and, and, the, and the fallibilities are showing everywhere, even as we speak. Um, I think all across the world right now, we're seeing an increasing demand for workforces that come from the STEM fields, STEM meaning you know, science, technology, engineering, and mathematical um, studies fields. Now, those, those majors and those graduates and alumni who come from those um, concentrations and areas of studies are always in short supply. The same is true of South Korea. There's always a short supply of, of engineering graduates, despite the fact that we have a university matriculation rate that exceeds 70, 80% every single year. Now, get, that being said, one of the few sort of policy solutions that are being put forward by experts is that we need to increase our number of immigration that we take in on a, on a yearly basis. But as you said, there is a lot of social phobia that is formed around immigration still. Now, whether or not we could call that xenophobia per se is I think a question that is still up in the air because immigration comes in many different forms. Now, um, I think it is absolutely true and it's completely indisputable that one of the only ways forward for South Korea to maintain its current economic competitiveness, uh, competitiveness would be sort of economic immigration over the next 20, 30 years. Yeah, Sunju, I think there's a question that would be perfect for you. Um, it talks about geopolitical scenarios. So if it came to an implosion in the North Korean government, right, and the North Korean government would basically implode, and of course it's, it's, a, it's a scenario, right, but um, and the government would be overthrown. What are the scenarios that South Korea could entertain and might consider for a possible reunification? Yeah, <laughs> that requires some kind of like a guess. Uh, actually, the Korean government official stance is that uh, Korea would not seek unification by absorption. Mm -hmm. So whatever it happens in the coming years, that is kind of official policy stance. Uh, policy stance. So in that regard, even if North Korea, North Korea collapses uh, abruptly, so South Korea will try to make uh, some kind of interim government and uh, try to uh, elicit uh, agreement or compromise from other countries as well. So in that regard, I think the, uh, the one of the highest priority on the part of the South Korean government is that the, how to maintain the stability on the Korean peninsula. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, there's a question, I don't know if any of you is an expert on uh, ASEAN, but maybe you can still, feel free to tell me if you think the question is not uh, up your alley, but the question would be, that ASEAN is actually a major destination for Japanese investment and also for soft power influence by Japan, cultural, developmental aid, and, and, and et cetera. And whether South Korea has any intention to do a similar thing, to boost its image and influence in the Southeast Asian bloc in order to match that of Japan. Yeah, okay. Maybe so, I can take actually, a... Yeah, so Shoni, you go first. Oh, thank, thank you, Professor Lee. Maybe I can take a short stab at it, and then Professor Lee, given his sort of expertise in political science, would be able to supply it with a much better qualified answer. 
Um, I think they're at your, the, whoever asked this question is absolutely right. Japan has done an excellent job in this sort of theater and, and, and area um, in the, in the Indo-Pacific, normally in ASEAN. Um, I think what China is doing with the Belt and Road Initiative, Japan is doing in ASEAN. Um, S- South Korean experts and foreign policy executives have taken notice of that for sure. And in the previous government, I think the Moon Jae-in administration tried to take a stab at this by with, through his um, New Southern Policy, I think it was called. Now, like I said previously, given the fact that Yoon song yeol got elected into his current position in office by creating a lot of stark contrast with his predecessor, it would be very difficult for the Yoon song yeol administration to follow up on the new Southern policy as is. If the current administration were to do something about increasing spending and infrastructure or, or providing aid or, or increasing economic cooperation with ASEAN as, it, as they should, it has to come in a completely different form, name and brand as mm-hmm. did his predecessor. And that point I think has to be sort of accentuated and highlighted. Right. What about you, Professor Lee Songju? What would you like to yeah, add? Yeah, I will just couple of, two couple of points. Uh, first is that uh, actually to Korea, the economic as well as strategic importance has substantially increased. Uh, on, uh, the one thing I would like to highlight is that uh, actually from the perspective of Korea, diversification away from China to ASEAN or Southeast Southeast Asia has uh, substantially proceeded for the last decade or two. Actually, the ASEAN overall in general has emerged as uh, South Korea's number three trading partner. And uh, particularly, uh, Vietnam emerged as uh, South Korea's destination of the FDI as well as trade. In that regard, I think the strategic as well as economic importance of ASEAN has substantially uh, increased for the last several years. And particularly uh, in the context of the US-China strategic competition, there is a greater need or necessity to diversify away from China. In that regard, uh, uh, South Korea will try to uh, strengthen the bilateral as well as regional uh, rela- uh, cooperation uh, relations with the ASEAN countries in the coming years as well. Thank you so much to both of you. I think we have time for one final question for both of you, and I'd like to ask you to be a bit brief with your answers. This is about the next episode of A Closer Look, which will take place in two weeks on February 23rd at noon for Zurich time. And it will be on the Solomon Islands, a country that, of course, was quite recently, one year ago, more or less, under media spotlight when it reached a security cooperation deal with China. So my question for both of you would be, how well known are the Solomon Islands in South Korea? And what is the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of them? Uh, Solomon Island actually uh, is not that well, well known. Uh, in Korea, but as I uh, mentioned uh, in my remarks, actually the Korean government unveiled its Indo-Pacific strategy last December. Actually in that regard, the Indo-Pacific region, particularly Pacific Islands, actually strategic competence of, uh, strategic importance of those countries have substantially increased from the perspective of the South Korea's uh, foreign policy posture. So in that regard, the so current Yoon Song Yeol government tries to enhance, enhance and strengthen relationship uh, with the Solomon Islands and other uh, Pacific Islands. What about you, Shoni? Um, th- this this is a tricky question because it's as, as Professor Lee rightfully answered. Um, the Solomon Islands is not completely well known in South Korea, at least to the public eye. But if you ask people who are very much interested in, say, international politics or international relations, who have an understanding of sort of global geography, they would say that it's a country that is affiliated with the Commonwealth. You know, it is it is closely uh, closely affiliated affiliated with the history of the uh, United Kingdom, so on and so forth. But I think they would be pressed to give any more details on 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 the region. So I think the next episode would be also insightful for Korean audiences watching your show program.
Well, then we hope that a lot of South Koreans will tune in in two weeks. <laughs> With that, we are actually reaching the end of our episode of A Closer Look on South Korea. As we said, join us in two weeks if you want to learn more about the Solomon Islands. And if you haven't already done that, please register on the asiansociety.org slash Switzerland. Click on the event and, as I said, register. Thank you very much to our two distinguished guests today uh, from Seoul directly, Song Joo Lee and Shoni Sung. You did a brilliant job in taking us into South Korea with your unique perspectives. And thank you, the audience, very much for your great questions and, of course, for joining us today for this episode of A uh, Close Look on South Korea. Hope to see you in two weeks. Bye-bye. Have a nice day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for having us. Bye. Mm -hmm.